Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. At this time, please silence all electronic devices. If you would like to testify, you must fill out a testimony slip in the back of the room with one of the sergeant at arms. If you would like to submit testimony, you may at testimony at council.nyc.gov. No one may approach the dais at any point during this hearing. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, I am Council Member Carmen De La Rosa, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Welcome to today's hearing where we will be assessing the administration of city benefits for current municipal employees. This hearing will center on the following three employee benefit programs. The Employee Assistance Program, which provides education, information, counseling, and individualized referrals to assist with a wide range of personal and social problems. The Management Benefit Fund, which provides a range of supplemental benefits, including dental and vision insurance, and the flexible spending accounts, which allow employees to set aside a portion of their pre-tax income into accounts maintained for certain health and dependent care expenses. A competitive employee benefits package is crucial to support the current employees and to strengthen the city's ability to recruit top talent. However, a strong benefits package is only part of the equation. The real challenge lies in ensuring that New York City employees can fully realize their benefits. Given that employee benefit programs are cru a crucial tool for the recruitment and retention of staff in the municipal workforce, it is imperative that such benefits are not, simply off are not just simply offered on paper, but are accessible to employees in a meaningful way. The committee is concerned that the administration of these programs are plagued with unnecessary processing delays, technicalities, and other bureaucratic problems that can frustrate employees' attempts to realize benefits or deter employees from seeking benefits altogether. Additionally, many employees may benefit from receiving more comprehensive instruction about the programs. At this hearing, the committee's focus is to gain a deeper understanding of OLR's efforts to not only create employee benefits, but also the critical role it plays in facilitating their accessibility and usability for employees. In addition to today's oversight topic, we will be hearing the following legislation, pre-considered intro sponsored by myself, related to OLR's administration of city benefits. Intro 265, sponsored by Council Member Joseph, which would call upon the municipal agencies to expedite the health insurance coverage processing for employees who transfer from one agency to another. And finally, Resolution 5, sponsored by Minority Leader Borelli, which would call upon the state legislature to pass legislation regarding the reinstatement of employees who were terminated pursuant to the vaccine mandate. I'd like to thank committee staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Policy Analyst Elizabeth Arts and Legislative Counsel Rie Osawara. I'd also like to thank my staff, Chief of Staff James, Legislative Director Kiana Diaz, and Communications Director Frene Familia. I would like to recognize that we've been joined by my colleagues, Council Members Joseph, Ariola, Minority Leader Borelli, Council Member Botcher, and on Zoom, Council Members Moya, Menin, and Caban. I, I now turn to Council Member Rita Joseph, who is present to make a statement on her bill, Intro 265. Thank you, Chair De La Rosa. Um, I am excited to introduce um, Bill 265 as being heard in the Council. A local law to amend the administrative code of New York City about health insurance for city employees. The bill mandates that each agency must expedite process to ensure continuous health coverage for employees transferring between city agencies, preventing any lapse during transition. This issue is particularly close to my heart. Before becoming a council member, I served as a New York City public school teacher for 22 years. When I transitioned to the council, I experienced change in my benefits, including disruption in my health coverage. As someone who had open heart surgery, maintaining my health insurance is vital. In New York City employees, moving from one job to another should not face any interruption in their health insurance, as this can de jeopardize their well-being. This bill would make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. And when I showed up for my cardiology appointment, I was told that I had no health coverage. 2008, I had open heart surgery, and I do follow yearly basis with my cardiologist. And come to find out, when I became a council member, I had no health insurance when I showed up at my cardiologist. I wouldn't want this experience to happen to anyone moving from one city agency to another. I'm moving from New York City Public Schools to New York City Council, not from a state to a city agency, but from city to city. 
So that's what this bill would do. So thank you, Council Member um, Chair De La Rosa, for considering my bill today. I'm eager to hear feedback from the city agencies and representative. I will ask questions as needed, but my goal is to see this bill pass in this, in this committee. Thank you, Chair De La Rosa. Thank you, Councilmember Joseph, and also for your advocacy and sharing your story. I want to recognize that we've also been joined by Councilmember Salam. Welcome. And I will now turn it over to Minority Leader Joseph Borelli, who, will, who is present to make a statement on Reso 5. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you for uh, indulging us by giving us this opportunity to have this hearing uh, about an issue that, frankly, I think most people would have assumed we would not still be talking about uh, in 2024. I had some prepared remarks, uh, but today when I got here and I saw all of the people here uh, to testify uh, on this resolution about uh, the vaccine mandates, uh, I was struck by, by the irony in that you folks aren't in your firehouses or your schools or your DOT garages or wherever, uh, and you're not there because you're some sort of cootie-written plague carrier or something. And yet here you are, and not one of you was stopped before coming into City Hall. Not one of you was asked whether you were vaccinated. Not one of you was required to put on a mask. Our friends here from uh, the administration, although not responsible for this policy, I noticed none of them are in space suits out of fear that they might contract some horrible disease from you. Uh, and yet you are terminated from your employment, which for all of you was exemplary and fine. None of you are terminated for any other reasons. You're terminated because you refuse to take a vaccine. So you can't go to your firehouse, you can't go to your school, you can't go to your DEP plant, but here you are just feet away from the mayor's office you just walk through the room where all of the policies of the cities are made. You're in a committee room where policy uh, for the entire city uh, is routinely discussed and made. You're in, you're in essentially, you're in the nerve center, the heartbeat of the city, and there's no problem with you here. But because of a wrong policy that was implemented, a wrong policy that was implemented, that is the only reason you don't have your job. And now it's easy to say because we know it was a wrong policy. If we look at the timeline, December 6, 2021, Mayor de Blasio announces a vaccine mandate. February 11th, a few months later, 1,780 city employees, some of them are here, were fired due to non-compliance with the COVID vaccine mandate. Just six months later to the day, August 11th, six months, now, I mean, just think about how many terrible policies are made in this building that go way longer than six months, all the time. We make bad policy professionally here, and it stays in place for years. But this policy was so fundamentally flawed and so stupid that the CDC, the follow the science people, the brain surgeons, literally, they said, oh, no, no, no. The CDC issues new guidance, acknowledging that vaccines do not prevent community spread, acknowledging that their own recommendations no longer ask for mass vaccination policies, concluding, quote, there are no public health benefits sweeping COVID-19 vaccine mandates, meaning there is no benefit for us to having this policy. And at that point, or really September 20th, when the mayor acknowledged that we're no longer to have a vaccine policy going forward, right, this would have been the great time to say, hey, you know what? We had this COVID crisis. We did the best we could. We followed the science, but when the science changed, we changed our policy. That would have been the right thing to do. But instead, the administration still refuses to acknowledge that their policy in terminating over a thousand employees was the wrong decision. I would say you were treated like plague victims, but the truth is if you had the bubonic plague, you'd still have your civil service protections, you'd still be protected by HIPAA, you'd still have your job, and we'd be paying through your health benefits for the treatment you'd be receiving. So you're treated worse than plague victims. 
And that's why this hearing is so important, not just to give a voice uh, to you, but to give a voice from City Hall and hopefully acknowledge that this policy has been wrong for over two years. Thank you. Thank you, Minority Leader Borelli. We'll now turn to Council Member Ariola, who will also make a statement on Reso 5. Thank you. Thank you, Chair De La Rosa, and thank you, Minority Leader, for initiating Reso 5 and for your wonderful remarks. Reso 5 supports state legislation that would require the City of New York to reinstate city workers that had resigned, retired, or terminated for non-compliance with the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Many people do not know that there was no protocol in place when the mandates were lifted that dictated how New York City workers would be brought back into the workforce. Some were asked to sign waivers for their civil service rights, while others were in the exact same position or similarly situated, and they were asked to sign a waiver. The state bill seeks to allow any worker who wishes to return to be able to do so just as many before them have returned. In February of 2023, the COVID-19 vaccine mandate was lifted. Many were really so finally excited, especially us, to be, so that you would be able to return to work, the job that you loved, and after you had helped people during the entire COVID-19 crisis and shutdown. But for many, that excitement quickly faded. Workers were not told how to reapply. There wasn't any outreach being done by agencies to guide those who had been separated from their city employment. And there was no protocol that had been outlined for agencies to reinstate the workers. Some were getting answers to emails from their former supervisors, while others were not. The law department seemed to act in a silo on many of these issues, and you will hear about them today. With no rhyme or reason, they made their decisions. You will hear from firefighters who were simil similarly situated, who were named on the same lawsuit, one of which has been reinstated with the department since May of 2023, and one who continues to sit in limbo with no income waiting to return to the department he bravely served for 16 years. You will hear about cases where Article 78 lawsuits were won and city workers were reinstated immediately, while others similarly situated and won their Article 78 still remained separated from city service, leaving them to have to find new ways to provide for their families and pay their bills. You will hear from those who retired not having to sign a waiver, even if they were a complainant on an active lawsuit, and they were reinstated, while others were not given that ability. So what Reso 5 does is support the state's agenda that there is a policy that is followed that is equitable for all our municipal workers so that they can come back to work. I have worked with many of the city employees from many different agencies to help them get back to work. We worked with the law department and we oftentimes could not find an answer as to why some were being brought back and some weren't. And we were given a complete runaround. And imagine we sitting here as the minority leader stated, we're the policy makers, yet there was no policy. So that is why we sit here today we are not, this is not a mandate bill. This is not an anti-vaccine bill. This is a resolution for municipal employees to receive the same equity as others did to get back to work, back to their jobs, back to providing for their families, back to teaching our children, back to being able to work for sanitation and for the DOT and for the fire department and for police department and any other municipal um, office and agency when we know that there is a reduced headcount and there is no one to, to fill those, those positions. We need this, this resolution to pass and we need Albany to do their job and pass the legislation at hand. Thank you for the time.
Thank you so much uh, to you both for your statements and your continued advocacy on this issue as well. We will now hear testimony from representatives of OLR, and I now turn to the committee council to administer the oath for this panel of administration officials, including individuals from DCAST who are present in the room for Q&A. Uh, good afternoon. We will now hear testimony from the administration. Before we begin, I'll administer the affirmation. P uh, panelists, please raise your right hand. I will read the affirmation once and then call on you, each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Pollack, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair De La Rosa and members of the Civil Service Committee, Civil Service and Labor Committee. I'm Daniel Pollock, First Deputy Commissioner at the Office of Labor Relations, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here with Georgette Gessley, Director of City Employee Benefits Program, Claire Camerata, the Director of the City Employee Assistance Program, and for Q&A, Claire Levitt, Deputy Commissioner for Health Strategy, and Katrina Porther, Deputy Commissioner for Human Capital at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. I will first provide an overview of the benefits OLR administers, then turn it over to my colleagues to provide greater detail, particularly regarding the Management Benefits Fund, Flexible Spending Account, and Employee Assistance Program. I will conclude OLR's testimony with some observations on the legislation before the committee. The Employee Benefits Program consists of five separate programs. The Management Benefits Fund, known as MBF, the Flexible Spending Accounts Program, commonly known as FSA, the Deferred Compensation Plan, the New York City Employee Individual Retirement Account, and the Health Benefits Program. The Employee Assistance Program operates separately from Employee Benefits Program, as does WorkWell NYC, the city's workplace wellness program. So the largest program is our health benefits program, which covers approximately 1 million active employees, pre-Medicare retirees, and their dependents, and over 200,000 Medicare-eligible retirees and dependents through our health insurance plans. The 95% of city employees who are unionized have access to additional benefits through their union welfare funds. These funds provide benefits such as dental and vision insurance, frequently uh, prescription drug coverage, as well as other benefits. They're funded through contributions made by the city to the funds, the amount of which is negotiated through collective bargaining. Non-represented city employees receive additional benefits through the Management Benefit Fund, which is administered by OLR. Similar to welfare funds, MBF receives a contribution per employee and retiree similar to the amounts received by union welfare funds and uses those funds to purchase ongoing benefits for non-unionized employees. I'll now turn it over to our Director of Employee Benefits, Georgette Gessley, to provide additional details about our employee benefit programs. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to go over what First Deputy Commissioner Pollack just talked about as far as the Employee Benefits Program is concerned. So if you would look at that monitor, then you will see that the Health Benefits Program, the Management Benefits Fund, Flexible Spending, Deferred Comp, and the NICE IRA. The first three are listed in the order in which employees use them. So the very first thing that you use is the Health Benefits Program. If you have out-of-pocket expenses after that as a manager, then you can go to the Management Benefits Program after paying a $500 deductible then you get 90% of that money back. If you still have out-of-pocket medical uh, expenses, then you go to the flexible spending program, including the deductible that you just paid. So that's the order in which this is used. What is not there is the pension plan, which is not an employee benefits program and not at OLR, but it is tied to the health benefits program. In order to get retiree health benefits, you must be receiving a pension. So if you can just imagine a pension bullet there and then looping back up to the health benefits program, that's how that ties in. <clears throat> Employee benefits program utilizes, particularly with regard to health benefits, um, various ways of communicating with participants. Uh, we 
reach out to the uh, agency reps on a monthly basis. We send uh, email blasts to employees about new benefits. We have open enrollment for both uh, employee benefit, the health benefits program, and flexible spending. And there is a very, very active OLR website where participants can get all of their communication on every program. Pursue, let me continue. Um, pursuant to Executive Order 99 of January 3rd, 2007, Consolidation of Health Benefits Program Assistant, the function of providing support to agency employees and the Office of Labor Relations in furtherance of the administration of the city's health benefits program was centralized at DCAS, the Bureau of NICAP Central. When employees from centralized agencies have issues regarding health insurance, their first point of contact is either their human resource departments or NICAP Central. And when employees from non-centralized agencies, for example, health and hospital, have questions about their benefits, they go to their human resources as well. If you could go to the next, yes, the next slide, I would just like to talk about for a minute because it details what the responsibilities are as these agencies come together. So the employee benefits program is decentralized. While OLR has primary responsibility for contracts, monitoring carriers, and so on, the actual administration in regards to direct contact with employees is decentralized. So let me go to the OLR. Is, is this the right slide? Or is, no, were you talking about the one back before? One, please. Okay, can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. Yes, that's the one. So OLR monitors the carrier's performance and claims data, administers MBF and flexible spending, as we said, operates the retiree health benefits enrollment and call center, communicates issues to HR and payroll, and advocates for all city employees and retirees with health carriers when they come to us with questions. DCAS operates active health benefits enrollments and central agencies, supports non-central agencies with health benefits inquiries, and creates new hire onboarding orientation materials. And then finally, the agency HR reps, they are the ones who distribute the benefits information and materials to employees. They provide benefit information to all new hires and to onboarding process, act as the first point of contact on questions, and bring those questions to OLR for clarification. So as I'm going through this, if you have a question, please stop me, and I'm, I'm happy to, to go further into it. I go through this and anything. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, OLR is the primary point of contact for retirees, as I said, regarding the health benefits insurance and to better serve our retirees. In 2022, we received funding to launch a dedicated call center staffed by OLR employees. That now handles 85,000 phone calls. 50% of those are, re are related to enrollment. 40% are related to Medicare Part B reimbursement, IRMA reimbursement. The remaining calls are related to retiree health coverage. And now we're gonna go on to, to the Management Benefits Fund, and that's this slide. So, First Deputy Commissioner Pollack went through these. Let me go through them again. The Management Benefits Fund includes dental, vision, long-term disability, basic life insurance, superimposed major medical, health and fitness, group, group universal life. There was a question, as I went through the list of benefits, I said if you're a manager, this is where you go as a second level. Well, if you're not a manager, then you go to your union, to the welfare fund. Flexible spending, everybody goes to. But that's the equivalent to the management benefits fund. If you could go to the next slide, please. Management benefits fund procures its service vendors 
through an RFP process. So the dental vendor, the vision vendor, those are actually contractors of the fund who pay the claims, receive the claims, and con have the contact with employees. It is done through an RFP process on a rotating basis. Every five contracts are five years. We have, in the last 18 months, switched out both the dental and the vision carriers because they were better carriers in the field. Um, and in the last four years, we also went through an RFP process with the super most major medical carrier who was rehired. The vendors are selected based on their experience, their service levels, the breadth of their networks, and their costs. The committee members of the uh, procurement committee are those who are members of the Medic Management Benefits Advisory Committee. And all of these service contracts have performance guarantees built into the contract. The, how quickly they answer calls, um, how quickly they pay their claims, and so on. That's all contractually specified. Just to give you an idea of numbers, if you'd go to the next slide, please. The SMMP, over the last 12 months, has processed almost 13,000 claims and answered 4,600 phone calls. That is the carrier. That is ASO. Their carrier has done that. Dental, we had 96,743. You can see that that's the primary program in the MDF. And there were 10,791 calls. Vision, dental, uh, by the way, we just switched out, and we now are with ASO as well. Vision, total claims process, 17,478 last year total calls 58.50. So, and that also has a new carrier, GBS. The health and fitness reimbursement program does not have a carrier. That is handled in-house. And you can see that the total claims processed by staff in-house last year, 6,837, and the total calls, 1,600. Let me just ask you a quick question on this. Sorry to interrupt the presentation, but um, the total claims processed is the number of the claims you processed, but how many claims came in? Do you have the breakdown of that for these numbers? They were all, pr they were all processed. The ones that came in were processed. Every claim that came in yes. has been processed. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I do want to say, even though these are all carrier processed claims, if a member calls us and says, I'm having a problem, or I received a letter, I don't understand what that says, and so on, then we intervene and we, we make sure that that claim either is not being paid for a good reason or does get claimed, does get paid. So that, that is the role of MDF, to intercede. The health, um, the fund's health and fitness reimbursement program provides reimbursement for both active and retired members as well as their spouses and domestic partners. Um, you can use uh, a fitness program, you can use city bike, yoga, any number of programs. Effective March 1 of 2024, the reimbursement has gone to $500 for each consecutive six month period or $1,000 a year. Um, last year there were, as I said, 68,000 800, 837, 1,600 calls. The flexible spending program, which is the next slide that we're going to go to, consists of two spending accounts. So what happens is a participant decides to enroll in one of these programs during the open enrollment period, which is in the fall. It's always for the following January 1, and there is an open enrollment every year. These are your, the participant is signing up for a single year and then has to re-enroll. Um, there are two kinds. There is the HCFSA program, 
which has 4,700 participants, and there is a DCAP program, which has 1,500. HCFSA, as I said, is the, uh, the flexible spending program, which is the third level, the last payer for whatever is left over after the health benefits and after the union or MBF has paid, whatever is left over you can bring here. The DCAP program is for um, child care expenses. The participation is very low, as you can see, and that is because if they don't join this program, people can take exactly the same credit on their tax return at the end of the year. So the only benefit here is that you get the money a little bit sooner, but the benefit exists even without this program. The way that the, the claims are processed, um, is that the next slide? I'm sorry, I, I didn't go through these numbers. So um, in the HCFSA program last year, there were a total of 28,059 claims processed. There were 18,500 phone calls handled and 6,500 emails responded to. The way that the claims are processed is that if we receive a claim by the 25th of the month, that claim is paid in the following month, the last week of that month. So it is, it is batched and paid on a monthly basis. That's the process. What you have here is the way that people can submit their claims through the LEAP file. Again, this LEAP file was put in during the COVID time. Before that, people just sent us mail. All of that went away. The whole world, not just the city of New York, but the whole world went electronic in communication. You started to communicate with your bank electronically and everybody else. We try to communicate the same way. Participants submit their forms here. They get an immediate confirmation saying that we have received their claims as soon as they submit those. Then participants receive confirmation of their claims once the claims are processed. They receive quarterly statements and they receive annual statements. The rules that govern these two programs are all <coughs> Internal Revenue Service Corps. They are under Section 125 of the Internal Revenue Code. The minimums and maximums are set by that. The way that claims are processed are set by that. Specifically within HCFSA, and I know that this is something that comes up again and again, people don't like this. In order to be reimbursed in HCFSA, you must show documentation of the fact that you have out-of-pocket costs, you have to show the original bill, you have to show what the health care carrier paid, you have to show what your secondary carrier paid. Once we have that information, we can process. It's a lot of paperwork. People don't like to fill, to fill it out. It's not our rule. It's the IRS rule. Just to talk a little bit about our website. Most participants and most employees get information from the website. We make sure that website not only is current, but is very user-friendly. We especially are proud of our videos, I have to say, because we try to make them entertaining, we try to make them animated, we try to engage people, we try to keep them short. There are multiple web, uh, web videos about the flexible spending program. If you go out and click on one, then you will see it. There are worksheets, there are calculators, all are there on the website to help individuals calculate their annual expenses and their potential tax savings so that when they are joining these programs, there is not a surprise at the end. And finally, if I could ask for the last slide. Moving forward, uh, we talked about that. Next slide, please. So these are projects and improvements that I wanted to talk about. Um, we are working on an FSA portal. We understand that participants want to see what their balance is, what has been paid, what hasn't been paid, and so on. They want to see their claim. In the early part of 2025, that portal will exist. Participants will be able to check all of that directly. That's what we're working on right now. Um, 
we are continuing to maintain a schedule of on-site agency presentations, both for FSA and for MBF. As a matter of fact, the City Council presentation from uh, both MBF and FSA are scheduled for September for the uh, HRM payroll. Um, we are developing webinars for both programs. And finally, because I talked about changes that have taken place in the programs and uh, the, the programs have been brought up to market level, both in the um, dental and the vision, uh, we are mailing out a mini MBF booklet in the fall um, very soon to all MBF members so that they will have all the updated information at their fingertips. Thank you. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Claire Camarada. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share more about the. the you have to press the button. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Claire Camarada, and I have been the director of EAP since 2021. The City of New York recognizes that experiences of mental, behavioral, emotional, and social problems have a serious impact on the health, employment, welfare, and social life of the individual, the individual's family, coworkers, and the community. <coughs> Excuse me. With this in mind, Executive Order 46 was issued in 1992, establishing municipal EAPs to address these issues that New York City employees may face and to provide support and counseling to assist them in seeking help and recovery. New York City has an extensive network of agency and union-based EAPs providing services to all city employees. <clears throat> each, each EAP offers distinct services based on employees' needs, but all the programs work in concert with one another to best serve all employees. The New York City Office of Labor Relations Employee Assistance Program, the largest of all New York City's EAPs, currently provides services to New York City non-uniform mayoral agencies, New York City Housing Authority, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the Department of Correction. And then in early 2020, the EAP extended its program to the New York City Department of Education which led to an expansion of the program, the EAP program, and increased staff by over 50%. Approximately 325,000 city government employees and their family members are eligible for New York City EAP services. While our program only form formally serves those entities I just mentioned, EAP never turns down a request for assistance and we have frequently provided services to non-mayoral entities who need it, including City Council. Um, New York City OLR's EAP is designed to assist employees and their families in resolving problems that may adversely affect their personal and professional performance. New York City EAP offers counseling and assistance with a broad range of behavioral health topics. The most common concerns brought to EAP are mental health related such as symptoms of anxiety or depression, grief and bereavement reactions, or traumatic events. They also come in with work stress related to job demands, poor coworker relationships, or uh, trouble with work-life balance. And then also they may come to us with concerns for family members, such as mental health concerns or substance misuse. Other services provided by the EAP include information and referral services, case management, extensive follow-up, and insurance authorization. Short-term counseling is also available when the client and the clinician agree that the presenting issue can be addressed within a short-term model. If the client needs a referral for longer-term treatment, EAP assists in identifying a provider that accepts their insurance and also has availability. So, in general, all services are free and confidential, and all EAP services are provided by master level mental health professionals. The NYC EAP also offers tailored um, <coughs> excuse me, services for supervisors and managers to aid in their response to staff's behavioral health needs. Stress management, suicide awareness and prevention, improving communication in the workplace, these are just a few of the presentations offered to New York City agencies. 
supervisory and managerial consultations, online workshops, and staff presentations are provided upon request of the agency. EAP continues to grow, reaching more clients each year. In 2023, EAP served 39% more clients as compared to 2022. That was a total of 27,000. And specific to our managerial and supervisory support, we have reached over 15% more employees in leadership roles than compared to 2022. Despite all the EAP has to offer and all the services we provide, we want to do more. We are devoted to educating employees about the program and encouraging their utilization of EAP's offerings to consistently promote the EAP and educate the workforce about our program, we offer the following. Online and in-person presentations to review the EAP program and services at new higher orientations. And currently we present at all Department of Health and Mental Health, New York City Health and Hospital orientations for uh, new employees. And then recently DCAS added an informational video that highlights the EAP program uh, to share in their new higher orientations. We also send bi-weekly emails to agency leadership to distribute to staff, and then each of those emails includes a relevant behavioral health topic. We attend health fairs, uh, DEI events, wellness events, and more. We provide presentations to senior management and supervisors on things like how to address staff that may benefit from uh, EAP support. We collaborate with unions so they can provide information to their members and our website, which is currently being updated, um, is going to be updated to be a bit more user friendly. So I and the staff at EAP are passionate about the work we do assisting city employees and are constantly working to better serve our clients. So thank you and I'll now turn it over back to First Deputy Commissioner Pollack. Thank you to my colleagues for describing those programs. We all are very proud of, of all the uh, benefit programs and uh, EAP and, and other programs we administer to help city employees. Um, so I want to comment now briefly on the, the uh, pieces of legislation before the council. Um, so intro 265 would require city agencies to make best efforts to expedite the processing of health insurance coverage for city employees who transfer employment from one agency to another to avoid lapses in health insurance coverage during such transfer. As mentioned during our testimony, uh, enrollment is handled through the NICAP system by city agencies with assistance and coordination from DCAS or through other agencies for non-NICAP entities like H&H, &H, uh, NYC Health Plus Hospitals. OLR and DTAS make best efforts collectively to improve processes and disseminate health benefits information to agencies to ensure that coverage is, se is seamless as possible when transfers occur. For OLR's part, if we're informed of any lapse in coverage, we immediately seek to restore health benefits retroactively for the affected employees. And, you know, Council Member Joseph, I'm very sorry to hear about the experience that you had. Um, that's never anything we want to see happen when employees are hired or moving between agencies. You know, our goal is to, is to make sure that people have their health coverage. When we are contacted, when someone faces an issue like yours, we, you know, leap into action to try to rectify it, I think. So, you know, we certainly appreciate the intent behind this bill and, you know, we'll continue to discuss it with the council. Well, thank you for that. But that day I had to go back home and wait until you guys reinstated my health insurance in order to see the cardiologist. This was pressing for me. I, I, I understand and I, again, I apologize and you know, I, we, we never want to see that happen. It's definitely our goal to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, you know, sometimes, especially when there are transfers between, you know, entities that may have different systems like Department of Education to a, you know, a, an agency that's more directly administered by DCAS. Um, you know, there, there could be issues, but I know we're always looking to improve the process and, and we will continue to do so. But I also wanted to note, to note that it was also the same insurance that I had. I wasn't changing provider. I was keeping the same provider, just transferring it over to New York City Council and there was still a delay. And even when I spoke to cardiologists to see if they would see me and then bill, you late, they bill me later, they said, no, I would have to pay up front or not get seen that day at all. And I was not seen by the cardiologist. Yeah, so again, I, I do apologize for that. I, I really, anyone who faces that information, you know, faces that situation, you know, as soon as we're notified about it, we will seek to rectify it. We have no interest in seeing people have that issue come up. 
So, Chair, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, what yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, T2024 2170 would establish new requirements on the processing of benefit claims, including requiring that claims be determined within 14 days of filing. OLR would also be required to create a city benefits help center, which would be responsible for offering information and guidance to employees about the availability and structure of all benefits for city employees. The bill would also require the establishment of an online portal through which city employees could submit and track their benefit claims, receive information about benefits, and communicate with benefits administrators. OLR would also be required to submit an annual report on employee utilization of such portal and basic data on claims processing. Lastly, the bill would require OLR to design and administer a one-time survey for municipal employees to provide feedback on the substance and administration of benefits. We appreciate the intent behind this bill and share the goal of improving service for our city employees, uh, but we do have some concerns about the scope of the legislation and the resources it would require given the complex nature of city benefits we described in our testimony. <clears throat> we look forward to continuing to discuss with the council ways to improve the administration of benefits for city employees. Thank you for your time and we'll be happy to address any questions you have. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I'm going to um, pass it to Councilmember Joseph to ask first round of questions. I also wanna recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Marmorado. Thank you for being here. And then I'll come back for questions. Go ahead. Thank you, I'm also in BNT, so I got a city budget to keep negotiating. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to know who's responsible for ensuring employees who transfer agencies do not experience a lap in coverage. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Porther from DCAS to describe that in more detail. Hello, Council Member Joseph. Hi. Um, so the way it works is that a um, uh, transaction is processed through NICAPS and the automated system will determine, you know, how the benefits will react. So uh, transfer between agencies should not result in a lapse in benefits. However, when you're transferring from an agency outside of DCAS's jurisdiction into uh, an agency that's under um, uh, DCAS's jurisdiction, there is a communication that needs to happen between the two agencies. And so long as that happens before the transfer occurs, then the process is seamless. If that does not happen, then we would need um, notification from the employee and or the agency, and um, uh, that would include um, the, submission, the submission of supporting documentation, and then we would ensure that the, the uh, health benefits are transferred over accordingly. So I guess my agencies were not talking to each other. Um, does OLR, o, OLR OLR track whether it, and if so, how often employees experience a lapse in coverage in the event of interagency transfers? We do. We do track that. We have an audit process mm -hmm. that runs every day, and it gives us an opportunity to, you know, review exceptions or benefits that did not transfer over as a part of the, um, the automated process. And then in a timely manner, we will reach out to the employee and or the agency to rectify any discrepancies with employee benefits. So you missed me, huh? You missed <laughs> me, I fell through the crack. Yes. Um, how can this issue be addressed to ensure employees do not experience lapses in coverage? And so once again, we can look at our auditing uh, procedures and ensure that we're capturing all relevant uh, transactions. It's, a, it's a, a bit difficult when we're dealing with um, uh, the agencies that are outside of, D, of DCAS's jurisdiction, but we do have contact with them, so we absolutely can work with these agencies to strengthen the process. I would love to see that. I don't want anyone to ever experience what I experienced, so thank you, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Chair. Thank you so much, Councilmember Joseph. I want to ask a few more um, questions. First, I wanna thank you for the lengthy PowerPoint and walking us through it. I wanna recognize that this is a complex system and so we're all trying to just get um, you know, our bearings around the process. So timely and accurate processing of claims for benefits is a core component of administering a functional and successful employee benefit system. Who handles the administration of various employee benefit programs offered by the city? And I guess you ran through that, right? But how does OLR assess the performance of these contracted administrators? You testified that there are performance guarantees for each administrator. Can you walk us through what those are? Um, 
I, I just first to start, you know, we can certainly provide some of them now, but we're happy to provide a full list of the guarantees. They're fairly lengthy, um, so we're happy to provide that to the council. Okay. Um, you know, I think some performance guarantees in, include uh, timely processing, answering calls, things like that. And when you say timely processing, mm -hmm. what is like your your standard for for holding this administers? We process within ten days. Within ten days, they have to process within ten days. Ten bu ten business ten days. Ten business days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What are the claims processing standards that apply to various benefits offered by city employees, and how are those standards determined? So um, just to provide some more clarification to the last one, that's really the MBF of contracted programs, so our dental, our vision, um, our superimposed major medical. Um, you know, obviously welfare, union welfare funds uh, would have their own contracts and their own performance standards that, you know, we're not uh, fully aware of. Um, for health plans, there are regulations issued by the State Department of Financial Services uh, that say that uh, claims have to be processed within 30 days if submitted electronically and 45 days if submitted by paper. So, so that's how much time specifically the administrators are given to process the claims and render decisions? That would be to, to process a claim on the, for a health insurer, so Emblem, for example. They would have that amount of time to do an initial processing. That could mean that the first, the processing, there needs to be more information requested. And then, so within 30 days, they request more information, then more information is submitted, then there's another 30 days process that and what about to issue a reimbursement is it the same kind of timeline um, no I'm not sure about the timeline for once you've determined that it, under for health insurance once they've determined a claim is reimbursable like now network claim I'm not sure the timeline for how quickly they have to make that payment I think usually it comes with the, the like, explanation of benefits um, you know for our programs um, uh, Gessley can, can perhaps speak to it if she can find it. If not, we'll get the information yeah. to you. Uh, as she testified for our gym and super gym and um, FSA programs, uh, if it's submitted by the 25th of the month, payment is made the last week of the following month. Okay. But I did find the answer to your previous question, okay. which was on one of the slides. So, okay. I don't know why I didn't say it. The service performance guarantees are 97% of claims must be processed within 10 days and 99% of calls must be answered within 30 seconds. Okay. So they're very stringent, okay. and we monitor them. How does OLR ensure that benefits processing standards are met? Obviously you track, but does OLR track the timeliness of claims determinations or audit claims for erroneous determinations? We do, we get quarterly reports from all of the vendors and we review those on a quarterly basis, we discuss it with each of them. We discuss all of these. Um, and as I said, what we do regularly is go out to the market and we bid. And if we hear that service levels are not where they should be, we switch out the vendor, okay. which is exactly what happened with dental and vision. Well, that was my next question. Can you describe an instance when OLR had to take action to enforce an administrative standard or improve substandard benefit administration? That's exactly what we did. We, we started to get complaints about Davis Vision, we started to get complaints about HealthPlex, and we were going out to bid, and that was part of the process that we went through, is that we took those complaints into, con into consideration. In your experience, what is the most effective way to ensure that claims for benefits are processed within a prescribed time frame? I can try to answer that. So you're asking about how, how we would ensure, the most effective way to ensure that claims are processed. So I, mean, I think, you know, as um, Director Desley mentioned, we do receive these reports, you know, staying in touch with the, the carriers and also hearing from, you know, non-represented city employees. You know, we all in our, in our jobs deal with employees a lot and, you know, we do hear concerns about, you know, if people submit things and they're not hearing back, if people are unhappy about certain aspects of a benefit, and you know, then we can we can address those with the vendor. And I think also the the RFP process really allows us to evaluate kind of the best um, the best vendors who can provide superior service, maybe to the ones that we had previously. I'm going to pass it to Councilmember Ariola because she's waiting to ask questions, and then I'll come back to ask some more technical questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Freaky, yes. 
So um, how did the idea of city workers waiving their civil rights uh, come about? I'm sorry, can you please um, ask that question again? Sure. How did the idea of the city workers waiving their civil rights come about and how was it decided who would be asked to sign the waiver and not once the agencies uh, determined, you know, that there was no longer going to be a vaccine mandate because it was lifted? Um, so I'm going to defer the question to OLR. Okay. Um, so under civil service rules, uh, when competitive class employees are to be reinstated, um, there's a requirement that they sign a waiver um, of their of certain claims. So it came from uh, you know civil service rules. So every every member would have had to have signed that waiver according to your rules. The rule was that uh, competitive and labor class employees uh, are required to sign waivers. You know whether every agency complied with that, I can't say, but that was the, the guidance given to agencies. So can you explain why some members were asked to sign waivers and others who were similarly situated were not asked to, to sign waivers? I certainly don't know every individual case. Um, you know, as I said, for competitive class and labor class employees, um, the guidance was that they should sign a waiver. Was a protocol given to the agencies regarding reinstatement for the members? Uh, who had been separated from the city service during the COVID mandate and once it was, was um, taken away? Yes, there was a, an FAQ prepared by DCAS and sent to agencies. Mm. Yeah, so I don't exactly agree with, with the answer you gave before that because there were so many similarly situated members and some were asked to sign a waiver and had an active Article 78 and some also had an act of Article 78 and were put back in, you know, without, without a waiver. And they were exactly the same. And that's what we've been fighting each and every day with the Law Department, with OLR, with DCAS, and trying to find out why, why there was an equity across the board and why there isn't a policy. And perhaps there's a policy now, but there wasn't a policy then. So is there a policy now? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, there was a policy issue. There was an FAQ issue to agencies with guidance about how to handle it. Happy to provide it to, to the council. Um, that was issued shortly after the mandate was lifted and it was provided to all agencies. Okay, and when, when was that policy provided? Uh, I'd have to look exactly, but I believe it was in February of 23 after the mandate was lifted. Mm. Do you know how many cases Article 78 have been won by the workers, city I, workers? I do not. You don't? Um, so then you wouldn't know how many of them were appealed either. No, I do not. So um, I would like to know the answer to those two questions, if you could get back to the chair. I with can those, defer with because the Because it's very important for everyone to understand that there was no real protocol. People were being brought back on the job and it was the exact same situation as another firefighter, another teacher, another DOT worker, another DSNY worker, another any municipal worker. And some were hired and back and some weren't. And they were told that they had to either sign a waiver or they had to drop their Article 78. Some even won their Article 78 and were brought back on. So I don't, I don't think that OLR was, really did have a protocol in place. Because if they did, then that wouldn't have been happening. There wouldn't have been such a disconnect and such an equity when members were trying to get back on. Did the law department, do you know if the law department tried each case or if the outside firm tried the cases for the Article 78s? Uh, do you know if that's? I'm not aware of the law department, the law department, how they handled it, no. Okay, so perhaps we can, we can send a letter to the law department to find that out because I cannot imagine how many taxpayer dollars, how much money in taxpayer dollars were spent to keep our first responders, our educators, and our essential workers off the job when we needed them most to come back to the job once the mandate was lifted. And we're not gonna stop asking these questions, and we're gonna make sure that a policy is put in place we're not gonna stop asking these questions until each and every one of those members who deserve to come back are reinstated the way they should be reinstated, the way their, their colleagues were reinstated, and there shouldn't be a double standard. 
Thank you. Thank you for the time. My pleasure. Okay, so uh, Councilmember Ariola led us into questions about legislation. So I'm going to ask you some questions regarding my pre-considered introduction in relation to the administration of certain municipal employee benefits. Um, would impose a minimum standard on certain claims and benefits process where federal or state standards do not control. Additionally, it would require claims tracking for benefits that do not currently offer online tracking, which include the health and fitness reimbursement and the FSA program. Um, does OLR offer a mechanism through which employees can voice complaints or submit inquiries about benefit administration? If so, what are the most common questions and concerns that OLR receives? Uh, yes, we do um, have a mechanism. Um, I can turn it over to uh, Director Gessley to speak okay. more about that. So there are a number of ways that people can contact us. They can call us. There's a telephone number for each of the programs. They can send us an email. If you go to the OLR website, it specifically says contact us. You can send an email just by clicking there and it comes to us directly. You can use the mail. We are under an obligation for a very long time by the mayor's office to respond to all communication within 10 days. We, we try to respond much faster. Um, the majority of issues that we hear, as I said at the beginning, are not issues that we can actually change. People say, why is the gym benefit, the fitness benefit taxable? Because it is, because that's the way the code is written. There's nothing we can do. People submit claims, for example, for HCFSA, which are for the prior year. We can't process them this year if it's for the prior year. That's a complaint. People say, my doctor doesn't want to give me an EOB. You say, but we can't process without an EOB. You must talk to your doctor and get an EOB. These are complaints, but they're not complaints that we can do anything about because they're part or parcel of these programs. It is incredibly rare that we hear somebody, and I can tell you we painstakingly went back to all of last year for both MBF and flexible spending to see how many financial errors we had actually made, five in the two programs in a 12-month period. It is exceedingly rare that we do that. We have checks and balances in place. So those kinds of things that people come to us about are really not things that we can do anything about. The one thing that we can is that people say, I want to know what my balance is, I want to know when my claim is, and that's the portal that, that we are building. Okay. And I would just add um, another way that complaints often come to us um, when they happen is through unions. You know, obviously we have relationships with all our unions, and they'll contact us on behalf of a member who has an issue. Um, you know, we'll also obviously hear from agencies directly. They'll contact someone at OLR who they know with the issues that one of their employees is having, um, and even occasionally, you know, from, from council staff about a constituent who's having issues. And obviously, when we get those um, concerns, we try to respond as quickly as we can. How long is a typical contract duration between the city and a benefit administrator or provider? They're five-year contracts. Five years. Would you consider including a new element in a future contract that would require providers to offer users a more streamlined and modernized means of submitting and tracking claims and methods to contact um, administrators with questions? So I, th I think any time we are doing a new contract, we are definitely happy to consider any um, improvements. So yes, we, we consider any and all improvements to improve the experience for employees when we have a new contract. In regards to the performing guarantees that you discussed earlier, are those, are those contract terms made available to the public? Uh, our contracts are, um, you know, we can provide them when they're entered into. I believe they are um, posted on the OLR website when we enter into a new contract. Um, so they should be publicly available. Uh, okay, we, we'll have to get back to you on that. I'm looking at our uh, chief contracting officer back there, and um, we'll get back to you with the answer on that. Um, it may be different for MBF as opposed to a, a normal city contract. All right. This bill contemplates the potential to improve the administration of benefits under OLR's oversight's power by increasing their role in offering help to individuals who are encountering challenges with claiming their benefits. If OLR is unable to directly answer an employee's question, 
what leverage do you think it would offer an individual employee if they if they were to have OLR advocate an, an OLR advocate assisting them with interacting with the providers? Do you think that it would serve a, an additional oversight on the insurance provider, successful administration of the benefits, and therefore increase the likelihood that the provider would complete their assigned functions more thoroughly and effectively? So um, I will say that when, first of all, you know, when issues are brought to us, in many ways I mentioned, we will always try to reach out to a carrier to help resolve them, especially when they're urgent pressing health issues. Um, you know, I think the, one of the challenges with you know, what you described is just the, the resources it would require. Um, you know, as we mentioned, benefits in the city is really complex. You have, we have more than 10 different health plans. We have 62 welfare funds providing all these ben various benefits, all of them for, with different carriers. Um, there are other union funds for annuity, legal benefits, um, education benefits. Um, and most of these things are handled by vendors. And our contracts essentially pay them to administer the programs and to you know, have a whole staff who would have to be trained and um, you know, really have an intimate knowledge of how health claims work you know, they'd have to learn the, the procedure codes. No one at OLR right now knows all those, you know, various procedure codes for health insurance. No one knows the ins and outs. That's really what the health carriers are for. Um, it would require a tremendous amount of resources. Um, and, and I think that's a, a concern for us. I understand the challenges. Mm. And I'm not saying that the challenges are small in any way. I'm not minimizing the challenges. But we continue to hear from city workers. And we know, we, we can acknowledge, I mean, how the complexities of this system. So this bill is looking to really streamline and help people learn how to navigate systems that are so complex and so foreign for the majority of city workers. Um, and while the challenges and the resources are needed, I think the council serves as a partner to try to make sure that the resources are in place. But only because there are challenges doesn't mean that it's not worth exploring as a mechanism for us to streamline these processes as you heard from council member joseph and that is you know a story that we hear and i'm sure you all hear a hundred times a day there are some city workers that have some serious medical issues their dependents their spouses and one of the benefits of working for the city has always been the benefits that come with working for the city the, st the stability of working for the city and if we're not making inroads into systems that are so complex that they no longer make sense, then we are going to continue to see the retention of top talent in our city continue to fee. I mean, we've been here in other hearings when we're talking about the vacancy rates across city agencies. These things are correlated and these things are connected. If people feel like, you know, that one thing that always drew people to city service, which was their benefits, their stability for their families, is no longer intact, then they won't work for the city. They'll go work in a private company somewhere where they'll get a 501, 401k and forget about it, right? So we need to continue to improve and, I'm, and I am um, glad that you all brought the data that you did bring because it sheds some light to the real, the, really the effort that you're trying to make in getting these claims processed and making sure that we're moving things forward. But when we put forward legislation, we're putting forward legislation because the voices of our constituencies are reflected in the issues that we're seeing here. And Thank so, um, you know, I appreciate your efforts. We're gonna keep asking a few more questions. I wanna see if any of my colleagues had additional questions. No? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about education and outreach to employees. Uh, obviously, understanding health insurance benefits and supplemental benefits particularly when they're um, interrelated, can be a daunting task. What efforts does OLR make to ensure that employees understand the benefits available to them and how to realize those benefits? Uh, thank you for the question. I think first, just going back to your, your earlier statement, you know, I just want to say I, I completely understand the frustration that people often feel when dealing with health insurance companies. You know, I know it can be a frustrating process dealing with claims. Um, we are definitely prepared to you know, continue working with the council to figure out how we can improve things for city employees. You know, I think, unfortunately, you know, the system we live in, we all have health insurance companies to deal with, and it can be frustrating, but we want to make things as best we can for the employees within that system as possible. So we definitely want to continue working with you. In terms of outreach and education, um, generally agency HR departments are the primary source of information. Um, we are constantly communicating with HR departments at city agencies. Um, we 
often appear at the agency personnel officer monthly meeting that DTAS hosts um, to present on either new benefits or as a reminder of benefits, current benefits available to employees. Um, we obviously also provide information through our website, and then there are the other efforts that um, we spoke about in our testimony, mailing a, a mini booklet out starting this year. And you know, when we, especially when we introduce a new benefit, um, we really make an effort to ensure that we are communicating uh, both directly to members as well as you know through the agencies. Which is one thing I find is that. Sadly, a lot of people will kind of ignore an email that's just from a central email account, but if it's from your agency HR, you know, people probably take it more seriously and read it. So we, um, we do work with those agencies to make sure they're communicating out to their employees. So going into questions about pension and retiree health insurance. Um, health insurance for certain retirees is a major benefit of, of employment, especially non-union employees um, are, not, they're so, are not, not aware of. Uh, what are the various ways a former employee can qualify as a city retiree for purposes of enrolling in a city retiree health insurance plan? Um, so that is um, governed by the administrative code and there are uh, a few different categories. Um, for anyone hired before 2001, you need five years of city service. Um, for anyone hired after 2001, you need 10 years, except for a certain teacher titles that uh, need 15 years of service. And the other requirement is that you have to be receiving a pension to qualify for health benefits. So if you're retired and you meet those service thresholds, once you start receiving your pension, you can also start receiving retiree health benefits. Is the information about the benefits and the methods by which it can be obtained communicated to all new employees at the beginning of their uh, career with the city? Um, so I know it's certainly contained in our um, summary plan description. Um, I'm not sure if every agency provides that to their employees. Um, is, is there any information we provide to agencies to include? Yes, we do, and we actually have pre-retirement seminars where we talk to people about the steps that they have to take in order to retire mm -hmm. and where the union, that they, the pension is their first stop and coming to OLR is their second stop and going to the, the, the union is their third stop, mm -hmm. and uh, it is very popular and a lot of people come. Is the necessity to participate of participation in a pension plan in order to take advantage of retiree health insurance communicated to employees when they make decisions about whether to enroll in the pension or alternative uh, alternate retirement plan? So they do they do come to us because we also administer the deferred compensation plan. So those people who are not choosing to go into the pension. Um, can go, can, can, there is a program called VDC that they can go into. There is also the alternative of putting 7.5% of your income into, uh, into the deferred compensation plan so that you don't, uh, you don't have to go into the pension. All of that is spelled out to employees, yes. All of this is on the website in great detail. And you know, obviously, we can't speak to what every single agency does, but we, we will, um, you know, make an effort to ensure the agencies are aware of that and communicating it. These programs provide important support to current and former city employees and strengthen the city's ability to attract new hires. Additionally, the committee is concerned that employees do not receive adequate instruction and information about these programs. How many employees participated in the superimposed major medical program last year? Um, I think for SMMP, we have claims numbers, but we don't have unique individuals. Um, we can see if we can get that information. Um, I believe it was about 13,000 claims last year. Um, for SMMP? Yes. 13,000. 13,000. Okay. So let me just talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, it sounds low. 13,000 sounds low. And we talk all the time in the office about why that number is as low as it is because people don't have $500 out-of-pocket medical expenses. An awful lot of city employees don't. They go to, um, to their in-network providers, they pay $20 or $30 as a copay, they never come up to the $500, then they never can take advantage. This is, SMMP is very much a catastrophic benefit, and that's why it's there. So, Following up on that question, then what qualifies as a substantial out-of-pocket medical expenses? Is it like a surgery or prescriptions that are highly costly? What you have claims that are over $500, mm -hmm. then you're going to be reimbursed for 90% of yeah. what is out-of-pocket. It's often when someone goes out of network. I, 
I would say that's the most common reason someone would submit for reimbursement if they've gone to an out-of-network provider and then they get some form of reimbursement through their health insurance, the primary health insurance, and then for the kind of remaining out-of-pocket expense would come back to, um, to SMMP. And just to show how catastrophic um, this is, if somebody has more than $2,500 out-of-pocket, they're reimbursed 100%. So it, that's really what it's there for. It's, it's, not, it's less for the co-pays and things like that. Our, our description of benefit programs provided in any other non-English languages? The prescription drug? Any, any, any of the benefit. programs. Are they provided, the information provided? Prescription drugs are in the management benefits fund. For managers, they have to buy the high option rider and if they buy the high option rider, then they can bring whatever is out of pocket to SMMP. Yeah, the question was more about language access. So are, is this information provided to employees in other languages that are not English? Oh, in other languages? Languages, yes. Uh, this? No, okay. they are not. That's something we'll definitely look into, though. Councilmember, I, thank you for... Just let me put the microphone. Thank sorry. you for raising that. Uh, look, that's something we'll definitely look into yeah. um, to, to understand the, the um, concern. Yes, I've often said, you know, I was born in the Dominican Republic, my brain thinks in Spanish, and I have to translate everything before it comes out of my mouth. Sometimes it comes out in Spanish, especially when I'm cursing. Um, okay, so health and fitness reimbursements. As of March 1st, 2024, the management benefit funds and health fitness reimbursement increased from 250 to 500 for each six months period. How did OLR determine this increase? And what is the average cost of gym memberships in New York City? So, you know, based on just preliminary internet research, I would say the average cost, it looks like it's probably around $1,000 a year, um, you know, in the neighborhood of, you know, 90 or $100 a month. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, a study on that, but that's some, just some information we found online. Um, I, when we decided to increase the reimbursement, you know, we had heard from a number of managers over the years that they felt that $500 was low, that wasn't sufficient to essentially pay for a, a full year's membership to a lot of places. Um, so, you know, we, we took that into account. We looked at the state of the MBF's finances, mm -hmm. and we determined that we had, um, you know, enough money, uh, enough revenue, revenue versus expenses that we could accommodate that increase. So it's five hundred dollars for st a six-month period. Yes, that's correct. Okay, I would still say that that's low. A lot of you know the gym memberships in the city are very pricey, and you know, even for non-luxury uh, chains. So you know, but I understand that it's a revenue question. Um, did OLR perform employee outreach before determining the increase, and how often are reimbursement amounts reconsidered? So we didn't do any formal outreach. Um, as I mentioned, it, it was something that we heard over and over over the years. Um, the kind of um, what Bill felt was a low amount for that uh, reimbursement. So you know we felt like there's there's strong support out there for it, um, and there's no frequency set frequency at which we reconsider. You know it all depends on kind of what we're hearing as well as the state of the MBF's finances. You know if we have if we're seeing that our revenue is above our expenses year over year, then we'll consider, you know, increasing a benefit. Um, but if, if there's not room to do that, then we don't really have the opportunity to. Okay. Um, one question we often hear about is the commuter benefits and um, the option of adopting to the new Omni system, and what will be the registration process uh, for employees who are seeking to utilize this benefit? Um, so I would have to confer with the uh, uh, Financial Information Services Agency Payroll Administration and get back to you on that. Um, I'm not sure about the current status of that. Okay. This is an urgent one because, as you know, the MTA has pretty much already turned everything into the Omni system. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't want people's benefits to just be sitting there, um, not being able to be used in this transition. Yep. Yeah. FISA OPA does manage the contract with um, Eden Red, our commuter benefits provider, so we'll check with them and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, I think we're good. Thank you so much for being here and testifying today on these important programs. I know that there's some outstanding questions. We'll be sure to get some answers back for committee members and continue the conversation. But thank you for coming today and spending some time with us. Thank, thank you, Chair Delarosa. Thank, so thank you, Council Members. Thank you. All right, I now open the floor for public testimony. Before we begin, I want to remind members of the public that this is a formal government proceeding and that decorum shall be observed at all times. As such, members of the public shall remain silent at all times. The witness table is reserved for people who wish to testify. No video recording or photography is allowed from the witness table. Further, members of the public may not present audio or video recordings as testimony, but may submit transcripts of such recordings to the sergeant at arms for inclusion in the hearing record. If you wish to speak at today's hearing and you haven't done so, please fill out an appearance card with the sergeant at arms and wait for your name to be called. Once you have been recognized, you will have two minutes to speak on today's hearing topic of the administration of city benefits for current employees. If you have a witness statement or additional written testimony you wish to submit for the record, please provide a copy of the testimony to the sergeant at arms. You may also uh, email written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov within 42 hours of the hearing. Audio and video recordings will not be accepted. When you hear your name, please come up to the witness panel. For our first panel, we will invite Jude Pierre, Sal Maita, Jacqueline, and Tom LaPola. All right, you may identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, hello, my name is Jude Pierre. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am a New York City firefighter. I was reinstated to the apartment after the COVID-19 mandate was lifted. We were told to send an email to the fire commissioner and chief of personnel stating that we would like to return to our jobs. I received the email back from the chief of personnel with paperwork to fill out, which I did and sent back to him. I received the email to, um, back telling me to make an appointment with the medical office. There were long stretches in between the emails from the personnel. Where I, and when I didn't hear back, I reached out to Councilwoman uh, Ariola, Ariola's office, which intervened along the way. After my medical appointment, I was given retraining dates and was back to work. Knowing that my brothers and sisters were still fighting to return to work, I kept in touch with the Councilwoman's office. I knew there were firefighters in the exact same position as me that weren't being allowed back to their jobs. My return wasn't an easy one. I think being out of work for months, I was finally able to return to the firehouse in the community where I served, only to be pulled off the job yet again and told to, the, told to report to FDNY headquarters where I was told I must sign the waiver, I must sign a waiver of my civil rights in order to be back in the, the firehouse. Yet again, the councilwoman's office intervened, and I was able to go back to the job that I love. The other members of the FDNY and all the other city, city agencies want the same. They want to work for the city that they love and the residents that they wish to serve. I ask that you that you all vote yes for Resolution 5, calling for equity for all city workers. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Sal Maida. As of January of 2022, I was a 16 year vet with the FDNY. The very next month, along with 1,700 other brothers and sisters serving the city of New York in different capacities were terminated by the city we faithfully love. A year later, on February of 2023, Mayor Eric Adams rescinded the vaccine mandate it was through grassroots organizations like Bravest for Choice that we were informed and instructed on how to apply to be reinstated. 
Within two days of receiving said instruction, I emailed FDNY Chief of Personnel, respectfully requesting I be afforded the opportunity to resume serving the people of our, of our city as a member of the department. Months passed before finally receiving official reinstatement forms, of which I promptly completed, notarized, and submitted on two separate occasions, as instructed by the FDNY. Yet I, st I sit here today still awaiting the call to report for duty. Thankfully, there are brothers and sisters similarly situated who have been justly reinstated without having to sign off on concessions as a condition to returning to work, as our brother, Jude Pierre, gave testimony to. The blatant double standard witnessed in New York City's reinstatement process amounts to a caste-like system marginalizing a segment of society as second-class citizens. The City Council prides itself on advocating for equality, and rightly so. We therefore respectfully and humbly ask you to support Resolution 5. This bill does not bestow special rights on individuals, but only what is inherently right and just. We thank you for your time, and may God bless us and keep us. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Wei Lin. I was an EMT with the FDNY for over 14 years. I'm here representing former FDNY EMS workers fired over noncompliance with the COVID vaccine mandate. After the public sector mandate was lifted in February 2023, there was a lack of communication and protocol regarding reinstatement. I wasn't informed by mail or phone call or email informing me of the process to come back. In June 2023, within one year of being fired, I initiated contact with the fire department to inquire about the reinstatement process. My three email requests for more information went unanswered for six weeks until Councilwoman Ariola's office intervened on my behalf. Finally, I received an email response in late July 2023. I was sent a DCAS waiver asking me to surrender my right to sue just for the possibility of maybe getting my job back. Other members were reinstated, no waivers required. Even retirees could return without signing away their legal rights. The double standard is clear and unacceptable. I ask you today, the city claims no wrongdoing. If the city claims no wrongdoing, why must I forfeit my right to sue in order to reclaim a position I should have never lost? And if wrongs were committed, why am I still being penalized while others are being made whole? Reapplying as a rookie EMT after 14 years of dedicated service was and still is a condition I'm unwilling to make. With resolution five, you guys can right this wrong, vote to reinstate every worker terminated under the mandate, send a message that New York values its public servants. We served this city courageously for years. Now it's time for you to have our backs. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tom Opola. This is gonna be my third time giving testimony here in this iconic building. And to be honest, I'm getting tired of addressing this issue. But I'm grateful to those on this committee who have been very supportive of the fired New York City workers. Some of them are here today giving testimony. As someone who was forced to retire from the fire department after 38 years of dedicated service by Bill de Blasio and Dan Nigro for not taking the shot, I believe I have as much standing as anyone to give testimony today. I'll be brief, but I'm gonna quote a fellow civil servant who was also forced to retire as well, my friend John. Americans refused to take the COVID-19 vaccine mandate, vaccine paid a higher price than those that created and released COVID-19. That overwhelmingly majority of Americans are okay with that. Let that sink in. But today I'm here to support those who lost their livelihoods because of that unjust mandate. Those who stood up for first principles and medical freedom. You know what Anthony Fauci re tyrannically referred to as, as um, ideological bull sugar, right? And they have still yet to be rehired. You all know what the mandate was never about health science. It had always everything to do about political science, but more importantly, 
political power. It's time to make those fired members of the New York City workforce whole again. And by supporting resolution number five, that's the first step. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to this first panel. I open up for questions from my colleagues, if any. Uh, Councilmember Mariola. Firefighter Mina, thank you so much for coming in today. So you're, if I understood your testimony correctly, the law department stated that you could not return without a waiver because you were a complainant and had an active lawsuit. Is that correct? Uh, actually, they never gave me any reason why I had to sign the waiver. The only time they made reference to the waiver was when they told me that they were not able to process my reinstatement applications if I did not sign it. So, but at I, that point, were you on a lawsuit as a complainant with several other members of the department who were still active at the time you requested your reinstatement? Yes. Firefighter Pierre, I know that your road back to your job was not an easy one and that you were treated poorly while you were getting reinstated. And I apologize for that. Thank you. But you were also named on that same lawsuit as a complainant, is that correct? The same as Firefighter Meta? Yes, that's correct. Yet, you were both named on the lawsuit, but you were not required to sign a waiver or drop your Article 78, is that correct? I think my Article 78 might have been denied by that point, but I was still part of the lawsuit. But when, I, uh, when they sent me the, the initial paperwork to get reinstated, they didn't include the waiver. Were you ever made to sign a waiver? Um, yes, uh, I was in the firehouse for about a week and my officer was having time, uh, trouble putting me into the payroll. He was like, you know, you basically won't be able to get paid until I put you in the payroll. So we were trying to figure out what the issue was. And then I got a call saying that um, there was additional paperwork I needed to sign. And it said, uh, basically I wouldn't be able to get paid until I signed the waiver. But I was already back working in the firehouse for at least a week at that point. So the waiver was an afterthought? As far, I mean, they didn't really explain to me why they decided then to give it to me, but they just said if I wanted to start, you know, continuing my service, as, well, working as a firefighter, I would need to start, um, sign it. So then, you know, I reached out to see what other opportunities I had because, you know, that, that would have factored in, in my decision to come back if I knew I had to sign, sign the waiver. And did you sign the waiver? No, I did not. And are you working actively? Yes, I am. Thank you. Firefighter Mater, have you ever been given a reason why you were asked to sign a waiver while other members were not? That, that, did that conversation ever arise? No, that never came up. It was never in indicated to me why that was so important uh, for the city uh, for me to sign that waiver. Was it given to you as a condition? Yes. And if you had filed for a vested retirement, knowing uh, what you know about retirees not being, ha being, re being reinstated without having to sign a waiver, would you have been asked to sign a waiver to be reinstated if you had retired? No. The whole point of this is to show that there is no real protocol. There is no real balance or equity. Uh, I'd like to change my questions now to EMS uh, Lynn. At the time of the mandate was ordered, a mutual aid agreement between the FDMY and the Volunteer Fire Corps was active in New York City. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. So from the time the mandate was put into place in October of 2021, where you were no longer able to do your job, members of the Volunteer Fire and Ambulance Corps throughout this city who were not mandated to get a vaccine were able to do your job. Would that be correct? That's correct. Well, members of the FDNY panel who were responding to the same emergencies as our valued volunteer fire departments were made and mandated to take a vaccine while volunteer fire department members were not. Have you been reinstated? No, I have not. Have you been given a reason as to why you're not reinstated? I was told that I need to sign the DCAS waiver in order to be considered for possibly being reinstated. Are there colleagues of yours that were reinstated without having to sign the waiver? Yes. 
same story. Yes. Thank you so very much for your testimony, and thank you so much for letting everyone on this panel know why they need to sign on to Reso 5 and why the state needs to pass this legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Chair Viola, and thank you to this first panel. The next panel will include Michael Kane, Trinidad Smith, Alfonso Ventura, Daniel Hoko Over, and Marlon Bethel. I apologize if I messed up everybody, anybody's name. Just reintroduce yourselves on the record when you begin. All right, you may begin. Um, just uh, identify yourself for the record one more time and you can begin. Thank you. My name is Daniel Holkauer. I worked for the New York City Department of Sanitation for five and a half years. I was fired for refusing to comply with the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Um, just want to point out the city council had mentioned nobody should have a lapse in their health care or experience that. Three years I've had no health care now. When Eric Adams when Eric Adams issued Order 62 mandating the vaccine for city workers, he added an important caveat that exempted celebrities as they generate income for New York City. I wish to apologize to Mayor Adams. I'm sorry that I'm too short to play basketball. My singing voice is best confined to my shower and not broadcasted through a loudspeaker or on a Broadway stage. I'm sorry that I avoided the open casting call for Home Alone, despite my grandmother suggesting my mom audition me, so that maybe today I could have been a world famous actor. I'm sorry that all I had to offer the city, of New the city was my muscles, my only contribution picking up New York's trash and plowing its snow. Although the city does make some money on paper recycling, my job doesn't generate Broadway bucks, so I wasn't privileged enough to be given an automatic mayoral exemption from the vaccine. As smoothly as it went to terminate my employment, despite me being a member in good standing of a municipal labor union, getting back not so much. I sit here nearly three years after winning our case and being ordered back at 6 a.m. the next day, treading through stay after stay until the city could finally be dragged kicking and screaming into oral arguments, and I'm still not back to work. They're going to keep pushing resources into the appeals against us. Mayor Adams chooses to continue to drag this out instead of throwing in the towel, giving me what is owed to me, and letting me go back to work. Here I am begging for a bill to be voted on to support other bills that order me back to work, when all this could end tomorrow with a call made to the city law office and they get told to drop the appeals and waivers against us and just put us back already. I'm just a callous-handed, middle-class dude the backbone of New York. I never asked anything from this city, but until the day comes uh, when I can finally get the call to report back to my district, I will keep coming here to testify. I will keep reminding everybody of the continued injustice being lodged against unlawfully terminated middle-class New Yorkers who aren't, who aren't asking for handouts. As I said at the last city council meeting, and I'll continue to say until it finally happens, I just want my due compensation and my, the damages owed to me, and I just want to go back to throwing garbage in the rain. Thank you so much. Next panelist, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alfonso Ventura. Uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, I, like uh, another municipal worker, was pushed to work. I was working in the biggest restaurant in New York City, the school. I was working at PS8, located at Amsterdam Avenue, and 68th Street. Even though I follow all kind of recommendation in order to avoid the COVID-19, I get it and I get immunization. That was my reason for rejecting the vaccine. Uh, uh, I was reluctant uh, when the DOE know that I reject the vaccine, they was pushing me to sign a paper, but I was reluctant to sign any paper because uh, to me make any sense. On Monday, October 4, uh, 2021, the DOE closed me the door and I couldn't access my job. Then from hero and essential worker, I became 
right away and feeling. The DOE closed me the door, but I didn't receive any letter, any email, any explain that, any, anything that explained my status. I lost my job, my car, and anybody gave me employed because I was not vaccinated. Without job, without money, and without unemployment insurance, I was a hero and homeless. I spent almost three thought years in shelter. On December 22, a friend told me that DOE was reinstalling workers that had been suspended by COVID vaccine. Immediately, I called Raul Rodriguez from DC Saving. He told me that I should talk to Pamela Rodriguez, DC 372. I sent her a text message on December 16, 2022. She answered it on December, uh, on December 22. I called her by phone and explained my situation. And uh, her recommendation was that in order that to be reinstalling, uh, I need to apply it again. I need to apply it again. Uh, to the to the DOE of uh, I reject her, re, her recommendation because if I do that I'm saying that I didn't spend more than five years previously the COVID uh, pandemic look like the DOE authority used the pandemic for get rid of guy like me they call unsubordinated. I reject the COVID vaccine because the own coronavirus create immunity in my body. When I get COVID-19, as a paradox, reject the COVID vaccine. The, uh, the COVID vaccine has been more harmful for my life than coronavirus itself. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. I would like to start out by thanking everybody for this opportunity to share my story. I was a tenured special education teacher in the field of autism for over 20 years. My main objective here is to shine a light on how difficult the process continues to be for me and thousands of other city workers in trying to get our careers back. The city of New York and DOE failed those of us who were terminated or had resigned with a lack of outreach and guidance on re-entering the workforce. We were only told to reapply as new teacher, as I did. I was cleared and I was put in the new teacher re recruiting section of the DOE's website. I had three separate interviews in August of 2023. My last interview was an in-person demo lesson in the interview with the principal in Brooklyn. Her last words to me was, I will call you this evening to let you know what site I'm going to put you at, providing you clear HR. My immediate response to her was, I don't know why I wouldn't be cleared as they are the ones that cleared me to be hired. To my surprise, I did not get a call back or email or thank you for the interview or that they were going with another candidate. Absolutely no response. That was my third interview in a row that was left like this. I understand perhaps one no callback, but three in a row is highly unlikely and unprofessional. I stopped interviewing after that, and I truly feel that HR is being instructed by the legal department not to clear me. I won my right to work in September 2023 and was ordered by Judge Ralph Per, per thesio to go back to work at the start of this past school year. I arrived to work with a court order in hand and was denied access to my job site and made to wait outside for hours to be told by the current principal that as per legal, I was not allowed back to work. After 20 years of service, I was humiliated and made to wait on the sidewalk. Just last week, I received an invitation from the Teacher Recruitment Center asking me to apply for summer school with a one-week deadline approaching. I would be genuinely grateful if I could work for summer school, as I have done for my full 20 years straight with the DOE. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, my name is Michael Kane. I was a New York City special ed teacher for over 14 years. Uh, I lost my job over the vaccine mandate and founded a group called Teachers for Choice. Um, I, I th thank you, uh, Chairwoman De La Rosa. Thank you, everybody here, especially the minority leader. Um, Councilwoman Ariola. you've just been, you know, heroic for us, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Councilwoman Joseph for being here and everybody for being here. Um, I first just have to just note that um, 
it really struck me to hear Alfonso talk about homelessness from this. And I didn't know that. I just met Alfonso. Our friend uh, Daniel Vila from La Voz Latina introduced us. Um, and that's the type of loss this, you know, this, this has had. And so when we're trying to get back, it's so important. There's two real things I want to talk about. One is that um, I've been involved in two major lawsuits. Uh, one is Kane versus de Blasio that is currently in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals paired with two other lawsuits. It's been sitting there 17 months. <laughs> uh, and then a state lawsuit called de Capua versus the city of New York. Trinidad is a, 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 a named plaintiff along with me in both of those cases. Uh, and in the state case, we did have a victory, uh, as, as Trinidad had just talked about. Um, and we're not back to work. Uh, you know, the appeals process goes on and it continues on. And the last thing I want to talk about is what Trinidad said too. She's blocked. She feels she's blacklisted. And we know this is in court record and we talked about it in city council. There are problem codes that have been placed on unvaccinated educators that have provided roadblocks. Some uh, educators have gotten it admitted to them and others like Trinidad, she suspects it, but she just can't prove it. Uh, please support resolution five. There's no reason for this anymore. There's no reason for an impediment. We might disagree on the past. I don't think we disagree on the future. We, we need to move forward. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Marlon Bethel. I'm a former NYPD detective. Contrary to the lies you've been told by the Adams administration, NYPD cops were not only forced out of their careers, but some, like myself, were terminated and today prevented from returning to work lest they waive their, right, their rights. There are members of this, this body that are fond of preaching the virtues of social justice and minority rights. So I ask, where is the equity that a minority, an immigrant to this country, a resident of the city, and a 15-year veteran cop with over 200 arrests and citations from the NYPD and the Kings County District Attorney's Office cannot return to work unless I waive rights bestowed upon me by the laws of this nation, state, and city itself. How can we expect workers, the arm of government, to operate with fairness and equity if they are being discriminated and extorted of their own individual civil liberties? The return to work process has been a disjointed mess from the get-go. There is this is in no way an outrageous statement. The NYPD's own procedure was not detailed until a week after Eric Adams announced the cancellation of the mandate and was not distributed to former employees by the department. I myself only became aware of the change after being called by former colleagues who, who themselves saw the mayor's press conference and had no idea about the details as the department had sent out no notifications or emails. After making numerous calls throughout the department, I was finally able to, to speak to somebody who explained the procedure to me. The, and this, the procedure itself was as arbitrary as the deadline that was set for reinstatement. It glossed over a lot of minutia like back pay, return to work, um, uh, return of accrued vacation time, uh, prior uh, return to a prior unit, pension shortages due to the lapse in, in contributions, and worst of all, the procedure explicitly noted that I must sign a waiver in order for me to return. Throughout my career, I have always sought to not overstep the civil rights of other individuals, including those who don't respect our, our own laws. As I sit here, I can't help but wonder why must I now give up my own? If had I simply chose fraud and dishonesty and, and used a fake VAX card, 
I would have been reprimanded and still allowed to keep my job. So why is it that having chosen honesty and actual science, I'm no longer allowed to be there unless I sacrifice my additional rights? Mr. It is Patel, time for this council to send a message. Can you conclude, please? Thank you. It, I think it's time for the council to send a message, okay, on behalf of your constituents some of who are all in here, and we all work for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Patton, I want to open it up for questions, so please don't, don't move for one second. I know that a Minority Leader Borelli has a question, and I believe Council Member Joseph, Minority Leader. Uh, just a question for Mr. Hulkauer. Um, you, you mentioned you won a lawsuit. Yes, can you Garvey just, et al. Can you just explain the, the merits of the case and, and what the judge found? So Garvey et al. was decided in October of 22. It was in Article 78. Um, we basically declared the entire mandate arbitrary and capricious. The entire rollout, we were ordered back the next day at 6 a.m., but the city was applying for a stay before the, um, the ferry reached South Street. They already had a stay going, um, and they've just been continuously staying us ever since. But basically, our case declares the entire mandate rollout arbitrary and capricious. And the, the decision also requires that you and the other complainants be restored to work? We were ordered back to work at 6 a.m. the next day. But as I said, the city, was, the city has been staying us for the past, like every opportunity the city gets to throw a stay at us, they'll take it. If they can throw a 10 minutes extra, they'll do it. W were all the complainants sanitation employees? Yes, everyone was a member of the DSNY, either 831 or 444. When and other employees that weren't a part of your lawsuit that was successful have been reinstated? Not that we, we don't know actually what's going on with anybody else. Um, they've kept everything pretty much in the dock. We don't know, we only know about the 16 of us from our group, from our lawsuit. We have found stragglers here and there from the internet and whatnot, but uh, I don't know of anybody I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, because we are completely in the dock, and the city doesn't release any information about how many sanitation workers were fired, how anyone who was reinstated. We do know that people from other agencies have been, but from what I understand from sanitation, no, I don't, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Minority Leader. Uh, Council Member Joseph, followed by Council Member Marrado. Thank you so much. First of all, Thank you for your service, my fellow educators. I was an educator for two decades before I became a council member, and I'm also the education chair in the New York City Council. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. How did you find out um, you could be reinstated to your positions? Uh, I, I found out from my lawyers and my attorneys. Uh, I didn't find out from the union or from the Department of Education. Same, we're on the same lawsuit, so I was told by the judge that I was cleared to go to work, and, and he wanted me there the next day, bright and early with the kids, first day of school, and I was excited for half a second. I can't imagine um, serving as an educator for two decades as well, so no one did any outreach to you to let you know you could return. You had to find out through other means? No, no, and even when I keep getting through with all these interviews to the very last step, all three interviews, they aren't even like, they're my, I, they aren't even allowed to call me back. I'm getting absolutely no, no response from them at all. And, and just one thing I want to add to that. We found out because the mayor ended the mandate two days before we went into the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. which was very interesting timing. So I knew about that. But we didn't get any outreach. Teachers reached out to me and to teachersforchoice.org asking us, hey, what's going on? What do we have to do? Eventually, I spoke to Beth Norton, who's the general counsel of the UFT, who told me everything, had a 40-minute call for her. I wrote it all down. I have it published on the website now. And when people ask, I send it to them. So there was, this administration has been really lacking in any form of outreach. It really seems like they just wanted to act like it didn't happen and make it go away, as opposed to admitting, OK, maybe some mistakes were made. Here's how we'll fix them. It just seems like that part never happened. Wow. Um, how many of those teachers have been able to be reinstated without signing a waiver? Do you know any of the educators that were reinstated? I know some educators who were. Obviously, they're not excited to come down here and raise their hand and say their name and tell that it happened. Of course. And I know some 
who refuse to go back because they're insisting on the waiver. And I know some who went back, some in tears, because they said, my spouse is going to leave me if I don't go back, so I'm going to sign this waiver. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to, but they did. So there is no uniformity to this. It has been a hodgepodge. It depends what district you're in, depends on your relationship with your principal, depends on all of these different big bureaucratic things, not a defined policy. Off the top of your head, can you tell me how many um, educators altogether? Just a of, of which, which category? Of that was um, out of work, that are still out of work, and those that have returned, do you have an idea? I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands, have returned, because they had to. Right. Many signing the waiver, maybe some not. I'm positive hundreds still want to. Mm -hmm. I'm positive of that based on the emails and stuff I get. It could be thousands, but I, I don't know for sure. Another quick question, just for clarification, our city is going through a shortage of special education teachers. And I know, I was an ENL coordinator before I left to join the council, so I know what shortage looks like. And this is a moment where we need shortage areas. And if you're watching anything, our preschoolers are home, about 700 that have no preschool education teachers. Um, and so you guys are, are needed in the city, so I hope the administration is listening and get you guys back to work. Thank you so much for Thank that, you. Councilwoman. Thank you. Sure. That there are teachers that were found to have fake cards, and they gave them a little slap on the wrist, and they're back to work. So, I mean, it's like if they want honesty, they're not necessarily showing through example. Teachers always want to teach, guys. We love what we do. We, don't, we love it because we do it. I'm, I miss teaching, but I'm, doing, I'm here for a greater purpose. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Marmorado. Thank you. Um, so, so I'd like to thank all of you for your service. We really do appreciate it in the city, and especially you, Detective Bethel. Thank you for your 16 years in protecting our entire city. We appreciate that. Um, from listening to your testimony, it sounded like you found out from other coworkers that you could be reinstated. Um, was there any outreach done by the department to the members? No, there was not. There, Nothing at all? There was, there was none. I had to initiate phone calls to multiple uh, departments within the, multiple bureaus within the department. I'm sorry to hear that. And as a retired, um, retired members of the department that were forced to retire because they did not want to comply with the mandates, were they able to return to the department without signing a waiver? And did anyone have ever explained to you why you were so being treated differently than other retirees? Y yes, they were. Uh, no one ever explained it to me. Okay. All right. I'm sorry to hear that. And I, I hope everything works out for all of you. And I'm behind you guys. Thank you. I want to thank this panel for your service and for continuing to come here. I've seen you at least in three other hearings. So we appreciate it and we look forward to getting this resolution done. Thank you so much for being here for your service. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank okay. You. Up next, our third panel is Christine Gross, Mo Olivieri, Diane Pagan, uh, Michael Tracy, and Edmund Wallace. Thank you. And it, you, you may begin and just identify yourself for the record so we can keep track. Thank you. Um, my name is Christine Gross. Uh, in September, oh, Christine Gross. Uh, in September of 2021, I should have been starting my 21st year as a teacher. Instead, I took a leave of absence because I needed the medical insurance, and then I was fired in September of 2022. Um, I was certainly not informed in February of 23 that by the Bar uh, Department of Ed or my union that I could go back to work. Um, I heard most of this information on the news and I didn't bother because as far as I understood there was going to be no back pay and no being made whole. Um, and secondly, I would have to find a principal who was willing to hire me and my principal at my school had just started that year so I had absolutely no relationship with her. And uh, as being somebody who has stood strong with kids for 21 years, I can't imagine any principal who's willing to hire me back. But anyhow, um, 
this should be my, the end of my 24th year of teaching, and instead I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I'm now collecting food stamps. Um, I thought this was about uh, being made whole and getting our back pay back, so I kind of prepared things that don't make, really make any sense for this now, but I did want to say that uh, in my research on, on looking into this, I found out that uh, you know, at the end of July of 2021, the city was offering $100 for people to take the vaccine, and apparently 800,000 New Yorkers took advantage of that, which I'm not a math teacher, but that's $80 million, which I can kind of now understand why they needed to fire us all if they paid $80 million for people to take one dose of a vaccine when the vaccine wasn't even effective without two doses. Um, so I am just here today to say that I would like to be made whole. I would like to go back to my career and not be six years away from when I thought I was going to retire with no money because when I should be making my 22 year longevity, uh, I'm now not making anything. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to the committee members and those from outside the committee to allow these members to tell their stories. Uh, my name is Michael Tracy. I'm from the Uniform Fire Officers Association, and I'm testifying quickly today to communicate our support for this resolution, which puts the politics of vaccines aside and asks for a transparent and consistent process to rehire these city employees. As, you, as union representatives, when a workplace rule is passed, we have a choice to either challenge that rule or to make sure it is fairly and equitably enforced. In this case, that sense of fairness and equity is missing from the process. In early June, when the city of Los Angeles, a city that was far more arbitrary in its enforcement of vaccine requirements, changed course and removed vaccination as a requirement of employment, it immediately provided a pathway back for these workers. We asked the more highly functioning New York City government to follow suit. I'm gonna change course quickly and uh, discuss the FSA because I have an opportunity and it's important to us as a labor union. Um, we talk a lot about in the labor movement and in this committee, I know it's important to you, Chair, about affordability for city workers who have families. I can't think of any better opportunity aside from a pay raise to deal with this than the FSA, which includes DCAP. Um, as many in the, in the committee will know, DCAP covers a lot of expenses such as camp, daycare, and other things. We implore this committee to press OLR on increasing windows for enrollment, that's very important. Electronic payment cards, which I understand might be a little distant in the future considering their discussion of the portal. Omni, eligibility for transit checks and uh, have agency provide direct enrollment as opposed to the janky OLR system, which is very difficult for a lot of workers to manage, and that's why we don't have a high enrollment process and even a lower usage rate. So we thank the committee for looking at this issue and hope they'll press OLR in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diane Pagan. It's been a long road to get here. We're worn out, um, excuse me. My name is Diane Pagan. I'm from Queens. I grew up in Woodside Houses. I went to DOE schools throughout my childhood. I'm a social worker, and I did a lot of financially helping people with the income that I had from the DOE, in addition to doing the job that I had at the DOE. I'm a tenured school social worker who was forced out because I declined to comply with the demand that I take a COVID shot. I was living in District 36 at the time when I was forced onto DOE's unpaid leave. If myself and other city workers of all agencies had been removed from our jobs and we had been bankers or tech workers, it would have been called a scandalous brain drain and Bloomberg News and Forbes would have been report, coming down to New York City to report on it, but we're not those things, and so no one calls it a brain drain, but that is exactly what it is, and we've been going through it now for about three years. We need Resolution 5 for a couple of reasons I'm just quickly gonna say, and I'm gonna give an example of why the DOE is not qualified nor competent, nor has any moral authority to solve this problem and why we need Resolution 5. 
When I, after the vaccine mandate was lifted and I tried to get, uh, and try, I tried to reapply, I was told, I was treated like I had to apply as if I were a total stranger, completely new to the city and completely new to the DOE. I will not sign away my rights. I will not sign away my rights. And I will not turn in documents that I know the DOE has every, every stitch of document that, that I would have to hand in in order to apply for another job. I insist on be, being treated with the respect that I should have garnered with my 10 years of service to the city. Number two. Can, can you please conclude? Just well, if you don't mind, this is, this is an important example and I'll do my best to get it out in yes. two minutes. Thank you. Uh, less than two minutes, because I'll, I'll the do my entire best. clock is two yes, minutes. Yes, I'll do you. my best. DOE created a leave without pay category and then reneged on the only term in, in the leave without pay that the DOE itself had to honor. Why do I say this? When the DOE placed me on leave without pay in October of 2021, it outlined what it said were the obligations under that leave. Under their terms, my job was to be reserved for me for the duration of the leave. However, in 2023, I discovered that the DOE had hired a new permanent employment employee into my position. They hired her in, in November of 2021. So they violated the terms of their own unpaid leave. And while I was on un thinking that I was on unpaid leave, they had actually already permanently replaced me. So DOE has no moral authority to do the right thing now. An agency that conducts itself this dishonestly, like the DOE and the mayor have done, cannot be trusted to create a fair and proper reinstatement process. And I just want to say in conclusion that you might want to look around and notice that most of us here are over 40, and that is another thing that has to be discussed because that would qualify us as being protected workers. I really ask from the bottom of my heart for the, for the council to pass resolution five so that we can be done with all of these past injustices and move forward. All we want is to be treated with, with a certain amount of decorum and not be once again put through hoops trying to apply for jobs when we were never actually legally and properly terminated. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mo Oliver, Mo Willie Laveri. I was, a New York, I was born in New York, raised in New York, went to school in New York, and I was a New York City teacher for 23 years. On October 2021, I was put on a leave of absence without pay because I refused to take a vaccine that's against my religious beliefs. April of 2022, I was re-offered my job back in exchange for vaccination, which I refused. Then February, I uh, hired my own Article 78. Uh, unfortunately, I, and I argue some of the same points as the Garvey case, the sanitation case that, uh, that won under George Porzio. Um, Judge Sattler ruled that my case was time barred even though uh, Judge Porzio uh, had said that they, it wasn't. Uh, I want to also highlight that the media has been misleading the public, public about reinstatement. A lot of folks believe that the city workers are back to work. A lot of people in the city feel like the mandate's over and everyone's back to normal, which is not true. So I will not sign a waiver because um, I won't, a waiver is a new contract. The city needs to honor the first contract before I sign a new contract, right? And I think it's important to, for, for that to be known. Um, also, I want to say that the city needs to correct a wrong that's been done to me and so many other uh, city workers at this point in time. I think it's, it's whatever happened during the mandate, uh, it's safe to say that the, the city made a mistake. Now it's time to correct that mistake by putting us all back to work. And also consider the fact that we are, uh, like someone like me and the rest of us, we have years of service. We're no longer able to pour into our retirement. So this, this issue is gonna spiral into retirement for many of us because there's going to be, you know, we may not have a sufficient amount of money invested in our accounts for retirement because of this issue right here. So please consider that when you also, uh, you know, when you guys advocate for resolution five. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Hello, my name is Edmund David Wallace II. I am here to speak about deprivation of the First Amendment right of freedom of religion, a basic human right. I have not worked since January 6, 2022, because New York City de not denied my religious exemption and my appeal for not taking the COVID shot slash bioweapon. The past 30 months have been a burden on myself and family, causing a massive amount of undue hardship. The lie travels around the world while the truth is still tying its shoelaces. Safe and effective, they said. More like not safe and not effective. It's easier to deceive someone than it is to convince them they have been deceived. Going through this process, it pokes holes in all three branches of government. How is it that my religious exemption was not accepted and yet countless other religious exemptions were approved? I am still waiting for an explanation of which I still never received through countless emails. To Plumbers Local Union Number 1 and Steamfitters Local Union Number 638, at the very foundation of your core principles, it shall be first and foremost to protect your workers' rights, not go along with a globalist depopulation agenda. Ephesians 6.12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the worldly governors, the princes of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, which are in high places. In conclusion, it is my immediate demand and wish and order that you restore all that has been taken from myself without due process, and all others similarly situated. That includes reinstatement, back pay, and full seniority. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't have a question, but I, I do have a statement. I mean, so far, you know, I, everyone who has testified has a very common theme. One, no outreach to tell you that you could be reinstated. Two, no, no, con uh, con continuity in policy for that reinstatement. Uh, no compliance with the court when you were ordered and given your civil right to go back to work. And, you know, it, everything that you're saying here is com in complete contrast to what the testimony of Daniel Pollack, the first deputy commissioner of o OLR, just said under oath. So I think that's very important because we're listening to people who are on food stamps, who were who were had no jobs, who are who were living with family, who were living homelessly, all because you decided to take a stand, and and you did take that stand. But I will say that that um, I agree with what was said. What was then is then, but is now is now. There are no longer any mandates, and we need to get our municipal workers back on the job. I want to thank the UFOA for coming and standing up for your members today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Mariola, and thank you to this panel. Um, thank all of you who came here to share your thoughts, your experiences, your stories with us. If there is anyone in the chamber who wishes to speak but not, has not yet had the opportunity to do so, please raise your hand and fill out the appearance card at the, with the sergeant at arms at the back of the room. Anyone else in the room that wishes to speak in person? Seeing no hands in the chamber, we will now shift to Zoom testimony. When your name is called, please wait until a member of our team unmutes you and the sergeant at arm indicates that you may begin. We will start with Anastasia Christopoulos, followed by someone named Jean. We don't have your full name, so please give that to us. Followed by Krista Odea, and then followed by Z Zina Wow Aja. Am I saying that wrong? Well, I'm probably saying that wrong. And Javier Vasquez. So we're gonna start with Anastasia Christopoulos first, if you're on Zoom. Time starts. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We hear you, Anastasia. Hi, my name is Anastasia Christopoulos, and I was a tenured speech pathologist working in District 75 for almost eight years. And I had worked the 2020-2021 school year in person at my school while more than 
of my colleagues were granted medical accommodations and worked from home. I worked in person with my special needs District 75 students who didn't mask, didn't socially distance. Um, I held their hands, I took them to speech therapy because I saw firsthand what being on remote speech therapy with a nonverbal uh, six-year-old child on the autism spectrum, how difficult that could be. And I went in person, even though I have a BMI over 30 and would have easily gotten a medical accommodation to work from home that year. But I worked in person and I was happy to do so. And then I came back in September of 2021 to the threat of the vaccine mandate. I applied for a religious accommodation and was denied. I was given 24 hours to appeal. I was denied and I was placed on leave without pay. I did not sign the waiver because I did not want to waive my rights. Um, and I felt as a tenured teacher, I, if you're going to fire me, then charge me with something and tell me that I'm doing something wrong um, and serve me with a 3020A. Uh, I was then told to reapply with the citywide panel and I did and I was denied again, appealed and denied again. I was not allowed to work anywhere within the five boroughs uh, for several months because I was not vaccinated. I was walking dogs on Rover. My family took a more than 50% pay cut and um, I eventually got a position working um, in Nassau County. And I took a more than 40% pay cut to work there. And if I do want to go back to the DOE, I was told I would have to reapply as a brand new employee. I would not have tenure. I would become a probationary teacher again. I would have to reapply for all my time salary has expired. steps. Thank you. I would not. I'm sorry. Your time has um, expired. Please conclude. Okay. Okay. And in conclusion, I hope that you all support Resolution 5 and get us reinstated um, and made whole. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Up next, we have Jean. Jean, we do not have your last name. So if you could please identify yourself for the record with your complete name. Thank you. Time starts. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. My first name is Jean and my last name is Jean. That might have been part of the confusion. I am here to support Resolution 5. Also, I was a teacher, a veteran teacher, 17 years in the Department of Education, special education teacher. Uh, I did not get the vaccine. I attempted a religious exemption. I was denied twice, and I was put on leave without pay on October 4th. Same as my other colleagues from all city agencies, there was a lack of communication, a lack of information, a lack of outreach from union, from DOE, from city work, any city agency to help guide us in what we needed to do or what was happening to us. I was not offered any type of uh, 3020A hearing. By October 18th, I was under so much stress from my principal calling and harassing me to see if I was coming back to work. I had to resign under the arbitration agreement. I was anticipating being able to collect some unemployment to be able to at least support myself until I could figure out my next steps, hoping that I would be able to get my job back in the city school system. I was a stellar employee. I never took a day off. This really was a very emotional, stressful time for me and losing a career. I not only lost a part of who I am, but I also lost a hundred colleagues. I lost something that I educated myself with 30 credits above my master's degree at the highest part of my payroll, where now I was, I'm working and piecemealing four different jobs just to make half the money. At the time when I decided to sign the waiver, I was under so much stress because I didn't know how I would support myself. Like many of my other colleagues, some of them wound up homeless. I could not see myself go in that direction. So my decision was to just sign the waiver, but move forward and try to put back together pieces of my life, hoping that the mandate would be lifted and I could get my job back. When the mandate was lifted, I did attempt to reach out to several principals that I knew. No one returned my call. HR did not return my call. So I am still hearing through the grapevine the same information that all my colleagues I support and verify that they also only heard that if you go back, you start at zero. You have to work hard to get back to where you were. You have to apply for all your salary steps. You have to find a school that could afford to hire you back, starting at the starting teacher salary, but having Time to know that they expired. paid Thank 17 you. years, you would have... 
Oh, yeah, you would please, have to please try to find someone that could afford you. So anyway, please support the resolution. Bring us back to work. Give us our back pay, our tenure, our pension credits. I was supposed to retire in three years, and now I'm looking at working who knows how long, piecemealing five jobs just to make a third of the money. Thank you. Thank you for coming and for testifying. Up next, we have Krista Odea. Time starts. Hi. My name is Christo Day, and I'm a former FDNY rescue paramedic. I was employed with the FDNY since 2005, began as an EMT, and on, upon completion of top class, went to Station 38 in Brooklyn, where I worked for three years before being accepted into medic school. I attended Paramedic Basic 9 at the EMS Academy and graduated in 2008. I worked as a paramedic at Station 58 in Brooklyn for five years, and during this time, I attended training to become a hazardous materials technician and transferred to Staten Island. In 2015, I was asked to take an offline role as the ALS coordinator for Division 5, which includes Staten Island and South Brooklyn. In 2017, I was accepted into the Rescue Medic Basic Training class and was working as a rescue paramedic until I was terminated on March 15th of 2022. In addition to my work on an ambulance, I was a mentor in the FDNY Explorer program since 2014. I was also trained in the Dignitary Protection Unit Counterterrorism Task Force as an EEO counselor and EEO liaison, liaison for Division 5 and as an alternate, alternate liaison to the commissioner. In 2009 and 2021, I received pre-hospital save commendation, and in 2015, I received Paramedic of the Year Award. I also published a call review article in FDNY EMS Pro Magazine in the June-July issue of 2016, recorded a podcast with then Chief of Staff Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cassio for FDNY EMS Pro in March of 2018, and was interviewed in April 2020 for an insight into COVID-19 emergency responders. I have poured my heart and soul into my career with the FDNY and have shown exemplary dedication to my profession. Being a frontline emergency healthcare provider was a calling since childhood. Working in this field not only allowed me to fulfill my passion, but has brought about significance and purpose in my life. I truly enjoy being a paramedic and providing care for my community. I had every intention of serving the city in which I was born and raised in, where my immigrant father worked to support his family and my immigrant great-grandmother worked to support hers. I looked forward to many more years as an employee of the FDNY and as a resource to the community in which I serve. When the vaccine mandates rolled out for first responders in October of 2020, We, lo we lost we lost your audio Krista we lost your audio I don't think she can hear us yeah I don't could Krista can you hear us we lost we lost you on the audio doesn't see I think it's a problem with her computer she's unmuted oh Krista Krista we lost you for a minute oh, uh, uh, can you give your concluding statement please sure so just to let you know that um, currently at this time, after being uh, terminated for being a paramedic, I currently work as a 911 paramedic at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health in New Jersey. My religious exemption was accepted without issue. There was no panel opinions deciding whether my beliefs were valid, and I am still employed as a paramedic for Robert Wood to this day a little over two years. It was very interesting to me that I could do the same exact job in New Jersey that I was doing in New York City. Just across the bridge, I was able to practice as a paramedic, which begs me to, to question what happens in the event mutual aid is requested by New York. According to the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, if I were to be deployed to assist as a paramedic in New York, I work, and I quote, work for the agency that requested me and would be, quote, under the operational control of that agency. I would then be working for the very same agency that fired me because of my vaccination status. Additionally, on the EMAC website under license and reciprocity, it states that whenever any person holds a license, certificate, or other permit issued by any state, evidencing the meeting of qualifications, such person shall be deemed licensed, certified, or permitted by the state requesting assistance. To clarify, I would be able to work in New York City as an unvaccinated New Jersey paramedic, but an un unable to work in New York City as an unvaccinated New York City paramedic. I hope this letter can put in perspective how the COVID-19 vaccine mandates destroyed the core of the city, the frontline workers. What was done to the hardworking people of New York City was and still is absolutely criminal. May I remind the council that members who lost their jobs two years ago have not been hired back, yet the city knows that in the case of mutual aid, those who are Krista, unvaccinated from other states- We're gonna need you to conclude. Please conclude. Yes. I am also a named plaintiff in the 
KKNYFRL, the New Yorkers for Religious Liberty versus City of New York case, which is still being heard by the attorneys Nelson Madden Black, ADF, Freedom Council, with assistance from attorneys Sujata Gibson, Christina Martinez, and Attorney Mendenhall. Thank uh, you. There is their Thank damage you. can be repaired, and there's always a time to change. Please Chris approve Reso 5 and hire back okay, all those who have lost their fingers and livelihoods. Thank, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to remind panelists. It is two minutes. We have been very generous with time, allowing people to go over, but going over doesn't mean speaking for an additional five minutes. Please respect the rules of this chamber and of this council. Two minutes, if you go a little over, we're giving you grace to speak because this is your moment to speak and we understand the severity of the of the case you're bringing forward but not for an extra five minutes please so up next we have Zina Wuja and I'm sorry I know I'm messing up your last name if you could re-identify yourself and correct the record time starts yes. the last name is Waju can you hear me Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I am a, I was a New York City public school teacher for 22 years, um, serving in my school as the only ENL teacher for a school that had high population of English language learners, as well as um, an alternative school that serves young people who are returning to school. Um, I was removed from my position and placed on a leave without pay in October 2021. Some of the impacts of that, um, because it was extended through my, to me, um, kind of runaround exemption appeals process, which lasts for six months. Um, as a part of that LWAP status, um, I was restricted from seeking gainful employment elsewhere. I was also restricted from seeking unemployment benefits and from seeking food and nutrition benefits which were needed in my household as i was the um, sole income provider in my home um, some long-term effects have been since the termination that happened in the spring of 2022 um, a depletion of my savings during the leave without pay period where i had no other resources except what i had saved um, being significantly reduced in terms of my retirement income, which I was told when I pursued an appointment with the retirement specialist who also told me to just take the shot and go back and then I wouldn't have a problem, um, that uh, I will not be able to recover that because that time was not pensionable and I have not been paying into the system. Um, and I also haven't achieved, hadn't achieved the age or the um, service time required in order for me to retire at the time that I was supposed to. Um, also, um, that, you know, I was also denied unemployment benefits again after I was approved by New York State Department of Labor. The city, my employer, stepped in and um, created a story to say that I was not eligible. And so those benefits were cut off and I have been making my way, navigating on my own. Again, I supported myself and my own household, but also I have always been a support to my extended family through the stability of my job and through the resources that I was able to get through there. And that has stopped. Your um, time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Xavier Vasquez. Please Time starts. Yourself. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I am a uh, Marine Corps veteran. I served two tours in Iraq. I uh, was motivated after the, uh, the devastating things that happened in 9-11. Uh, I um, was terminated in 2022 uh, for my religious beliefs. Uh, uh, my religious exemption got denied. I also practice my rights to not disclose if I was vaccinated or not, uh, which I never, I, so I never did. Um, I, co I did comply with the weekly testing um, despite of that because I was coerced to, to do that or have to be escorted outside of the building. Um, I lost a secure, a secure job that I trusted after I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I did get my social degree. I didn't continue because I trusted the city to uh, uh, keep me employed. Uh, I, uh, it, I've been impacted by the termination. Um, my family has struggled to, to eat. Um, 
to keep the utilities on. We've had to uh, sell our house, get rid of our animals. Um, that's even including um, farm animals because I had a, a dream home. Um, I was happy to be in the FDNY. Um, I support the Rezo 5 um, to, for us to go back to um, our jobs. But in the same time, I would like to feel some security that once we go back to our jobs, that we have the option of, of retiring because uh, of the stigma that's been created. Um, uh, the division has been a uh, prejudice that uh, we're the unvaccinated um, has caused a little bit of a stir at, the, at, at uh, a division is what I would say. And I don't really trust the city anymore uh, that I fought for overseas. Um, I, I honestly feel betrayed and, and um, I almost lost my family um, because of the emotional um, trauma that is caused within uh, my family. I, uh, I, have a t I have a really hard time being able to make sure that my family stays alive during these days. I have a one-year-old baby, a uh, three-year-old, a uh, 17-year-old, and a 12-year-old that has ADHD. So uh, I, I, to be honest, I feel very betrayed and hurt. Um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, um, Mr. Vasquez. Um, Councilman Mariola has just two questions for you. Hold on one sec. Uh, Firefighter Vasquez, did you, did you have an Article 78 filed? I won my Article 78 and the city uh, has appealed it. They told the judge that I can call my job at any time and uh, get my job back in which I did. I called them and I also emailed them and they, they, they directed me back to the city saying that uh, they were instructed that uh, everything is being handled in court. So they denied me to, give, to get my job back. So I have my, uh, my lawyer, Christina Martinez, uh, representing me uh, currently in federal court. When the FDNY told you that, did they give you a reason that you were not being allowed to come back to work even though the court mandated that you do, that you won your lawsuit? and your right to go back to work? Did they give you a reason why? No, they gave me no reason. And uh, there's a lot of confusion on why I'm not allowed to go back. Uh, it's, uh, it just seems uh, discriminatory in many different ways. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Vasquez. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for coming and testifying, sharing your story. Um, if you are currently on Zoom and wish to speak but not, have not yet had the opportunity to do so, please use the raise hand function and our staff will unmute you. Seeing no hands, I would like to note that everyone can submit written testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov within 72 hours of this hearing. To conclude, I would like to thank my colleagues, Ms. Ms. Ariola, who's still here, um, and all of you uh, who came out to share your stories. Um, you know, making sure that um, the administration of benefits for city employees is a more seamless process, as well as of the staff who have helped uh, to prepare this hearing as well. They're all city employees. Um, we want to thank them for coming, for allowing us to have this important hearing on city benefits. In addition, we would also like to thank all of you who are still sitting in this room um, for sharing your stories. As I said before, this is not the first time you're here. Um, we're looking forward to getting Resolution 5 passed and for all of you to be reinstated. Um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, to express my thank you for all of your interest and your advocacy today. Thank you for all the work you, that you do and for your, your collective service to our city. With that, this hearing is now concluded and I hope everyone makes it home safe.